This is the 13th meeting of criminal law. The Model Penal Code drafters did away with the attempt to divide the crime of murder into degrees. What the Pennsylvania Statute of 1794 had put asunder, the Model Penal Code put back together. Premeditation, the distinctive element of first-degree murder, was transformed into a sentencing factor, which might be either aggravating or mitigating, depending on the larger picture of facts and circumstances weighed at the sentencing phase. We might have been surprised that the Model Penal Code decided to keep the distinction between murder and voluntary manslaughter, but it did. Traditional doctrine relied on the ideas of provocation and heat of passion. The Model Penal Code banished those expressions and replaced them with the concept of extreme mental or emotional disturbance for which there is reasonable explanation or excuse. So much for now for voluntary manslaughter. Let's turn our attention to the other kind of manslaughter, the so-called involuntary kind, called involuntary because the defendant meant no harm by his voluntary conduct. The classic case is Commonwealth versus Wolanski. Wolanski was the owner of the Coconut Grove nightclub in Boston. One night, a fire broke out in the nightclub and spread so quickly that hundreds of people were trapped inside. Hundreds died. Wolanski happened to have been in the hospital and was not present that night. Years later, upon his release from prison, he said he'd wished he'd died that night in the Coconut Grove fire. Wolanski was convicted of involuntary manslaughter. The prosecution proved that many died due to poor safety conditions that it was Wolanski's duty to have corrected. Exits were few, poorly marked, concealed, or locked shut. Scores of people died trying to escape through the one entrance to the club, a revolving door. Obviously, Wolanski faced liability in tort. You will recall the celebrated hand formula meant to explain the duty of reasonable care. Was the burden of precautions that would have avoided loss of life greater than the discounted probability of that loss? A civil jury found that the burden wasn't so great, although no one could say with certainty why the fire had spread so quickly. So Barney Wolanski faced tort liability, and he had meant no harm to anyone, yet he was prosecuted for criminal homicide. Criminal homicides are of two kinds. One kind involves intended harm. It might be considered worse if there is evidence of premeditation, it might be considered less bad if there is evidence that the act was impassioned. Now draw a line between those and cases in which no harm was intended. Many of these will be cases in which the defendant accidentally caused death. The actor faces no liability criminally or in tort. But if the actor has been negligent, she will face civil liability. That raises the question whether the negligent defendant ought, in addition, to be held criminally liable for negligently causing another's death. The traditional answer was no. No criminal liability for merely negligent killing. But the tradition also holds that the defendant who wantonly or recklessly causes death can be convicted of a homicide offense. This offense is misleadingly called involuntary manslaughter. The offense of manslaughter can be divided into two varieties. 
there is voluntary manslaughter, traditionally an impassioned killing upon legally adequate provocation, and now we add involuntary manslaughter. The involuntary does not mean that the prosecution need not show a voluntary act. It only means that the defendant did not intend to cause death or harm. The line between mere negligent homicide and manslaughter of the involuntary kind is drawn in terms of culpability. The culpability needed to be shown to convict an actor of manslaughter is greater than mere negligence, but it need not be as great as knowledge or purpose. Where exactly is this line located, and how is it defined? Wanton and reckless conduct must be shown, but what does that mean? The Wolanski Court expresses it this way. The words wanton and reckless express a difference in the degree of risk and in the voluntary taking of risk, so marked as to amount to a difference in kind. There are two dimensions in play. Degree of risk. This degree must be greater than the minimum sufficient to establish ordinary tort negligence. And also there is voluntary taking of risk. Merely inadvertent risk-taking is not enough to push the defendant's conduct over the line. Let's visualize it this way. An ordinary deviation from the standard of reasonable care suffices in tort. But to convict Wolanski of manslaughter, the prosecution must prove a gross deviation from the reasonable person's standard of care. Gross meaning big. There is also a subjective dimension. The actor's awareness of the risk he's taking has also to be shown. The merely clueless actor is not reckless, no matter how great the risk he obliviously takes. The actor might be dimly aware, or perhaps fully aware. The world presents us with infinite degrees, but the law seeks to draw lines. This much is fairly clear. The law insists we distinguish between an ordinary deviation and a gross deviation from the standard of reasonable care. The law also insists we distinguish the actor who is aware of risk from the actor who is not aware of risk. We can appreciate that it is not good if the obliviously negligent actor kills another person. It is bad if the oblivious actor's conduct is a gross deviation from the standard, and it is bad if an actor is aware she is acting negligently and someone dies as a result. But intuitively, the worst case is that of the actor who takes a great risk with awareness she is doing so, causing another's death. The Wolanski court evidently wishes to impose a manslaughter conviction only in the worst of these cases, that of the actor who, with awareness, takes a risk that amounts to a gross deviation from the standard of ordinary reasonable care. The Wolanski court thus approves this language in the trial court's charge to the jury. To constitute wanton or reckless conduct as distinguished from mere negligence, grave danger to others must have been apparent and the defendant must have chosen to run the risk. The reckless actor must be proven to have been consciously aware of the great risk to others. Unfortunately, the court goes on to approve further language in the trial court's jury instruction. But even if 
so stupid or so heedless that in fact that he did not realize the grave danger, he cannot escape liability if an ordinary normal man under the same circumstances would have realized the gravity of the risk. In other words, awareness drops out. As a later Massachusetts decision states, wanton or reckless conduct is determined based either on the defendant's specific knowledge or on what a reasonable person should have known in the circumstances. So the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has effectively chosen to allow an oblivious but grossly negligent actor to be convicted of involuntary manslaughter. Oh.